Hi, I'm Yvette Craddock, and you're watching Frame. I had such a great time learning from Julie Staub and Jonathan Sabin that I had to find a resource to help me understand digital camera technology. So I went to the source in downtown Iowa City. With me today is Roger Christian, um, University Camera. Roger, welcome to Frame. How are you? I'm well, thank you. And you? Oh, doing well. Good. Thanks for helping me out here. Sure. All right, so I have my, I brought my camera that I love. It's a little, you know, I used to, you see that, right? You know, but I'm just not willing to let it go yet. But I know soon I will need an upgrade. But before we get into what potential upgrade I might need, I wanted to know if you would just give me a lay of the land for best camera options if I'm a novice, if I'm intermediate, or if I'm, I'm uh, more on the professional advanced level. Okay, level. all right. Uh, you can do it in three basic steps. Uh, the first step is a camera that's now current. These things, of course, change very quickly. Yes. As opposed to your camera here. These are basically similar, if not identical, in terms of what they do. Okay. But things have changed, but of course that's no surprise in today's world. No. Your camera's pretty basic. You know, let's go to a party camera, let's go take pictures of the kids' camera, let's go take pictures of our friend's camera. Okay. So, works very well, and frankly, there's nothing wrong with this. Oh, I could keep it. You could, yeah. I mean, it looks like it's seen a lot of miles. <laughs> it has. I it take has. it everywhere. <laughs> right, okay. But you've had fun. So, yeah. But what's happened, of course, is that over the course of time, the number of megapixels that the camera offers, they started at two or three and were $1,000. Mm -hmm. We're now at 12 to 14 megapixel cameras for under 200, but they also have image stabilization and a lot of other features. Okay. So the current state of the, the uh, art here is a Panasonic, for example, and Panasonic's not anything in particular, it's just this is what I happen to grab off the shelf. But the newest innovation is GPS. It won't tell you how to get back to your car, but it will tell you where you've been. <laughs> they want to so, know where you are all the time. Everything is GPS. Well, I, I always figure that if you know when something happened and where it happened, you've got it pretty well nailed down. True. But in any case, GPS allows you to uh, know where the picture was taken, and you could theoretically assemble your trip by GPS coordinates or however you wanted to do it within the... Uh, within the images. but So that offers a lot of stuff. Uh, movies, of course, are pretty much standard on all of them, and then each camera has its own little series of quirks uh, that make it different from everybody else's. Uh, in Panasonic's case, for example, a lot of the cameras will have very long zoom ranges. This one, for example, is 12 time optical zoom. So if I were to stand uh, 15 feet away from somebody, by the time I zoomed in, as if it would be as if I were and a foot and a half away from them in terms of the image size. Oh, so lots nice. of little things going on and of course this is a continuing to evolve sort of deal. So that's the basic starter camera okay. that replaces yours as an option. All right. Second is what we call now and started out in the 35 millimeter world what's called a bridge camera. This offers uh, the ability to have a camera that's relatively compact, relatively lightweight and an all-in-one piece but because it's got a longer tube on the front, you can go up to a 24 time zoom. So things that were 50 feet away, you can zoom in so they now look like they're two feet away, roughly. Oh, wow. uh, a friend of mine has one of these. He used to shoot birds and all kinds of things in his backyard sitting on his deck. So it allows him to do a headshot of an owl from 40 feet away. Oh. So pretty astounding. So that's number two. Well, wait a minute, I have a and question. I'm gonna stop. All, <laughs> all in one. All in one. What does that mean? You can't take the lens off. It has a longer zoom range oh. than this. And in order to accommodate this extremely long zoom range, let me just turn this thing on here. Maybe we can, maybe we can run the two of them together. Uh, memory card full. Well, okay. The zoom will come on out quite a ways, and you can not quite read the menu across the street, but it comes pretty close. Okay. 
but megapixels, is there a difference or is it just? These are all running generally in the 12 to 14 megapixel range and that's pretty much current state of the art. It's a matter of balancing what's the camera gonna sell for, so it's a price point issue, what the sensor costs and what it costs to do the other little stuff that goes along. These two cameras, although they're not necessarily representative in their groups, they're in the range of between uh, $399, this has gone up because it has GPS in it. This one runs around the same or a little less, but it's, oh. you know, so take your pick for that price. The cameras are ranging now from $99 to $500 is pretty much almost anything you want in these types of cameras. This looks more official. Yeah, well, <laughs> people are shooting weddings with these. That's amazing. I mean, they're really good. And now that's the super official over here. Well, um, or are, closer. Yeah, and I, I have to say one thing that's going to okay. make you very happy. Okay. You are now our current target customer in the industry. All right. Uh, men aren't quite so much in the market anymore. It's young women from the age of 22 to 45 and a little older. Uh -huh. uh, generally speaking, a couple of kids. Um, the kids are leaving the nest, as it were. They're all off to kindergarten and school. Got it. Mom needs something to keep herself occupied and also to document the family. So, what we're ending up with now is a lot of uh, uh, women are coming in and purchasing cameras like this, which at the uh, years ago were strictly the domain of men. So, what we have is interchangeable lenses, Ooh, uh, cool. 15 to 18 megapixels. So, now you can drop on a telephoto lens to take pictures of the kids running around the yard, and you can sit in one sort of fixed place and shoot them in these various places that they're playing or running around and track them while they're doing it. So telephoto lens, does that enable better action shots then, as well as distance, or? It allows you to bring things in closer, just like these two cameras do with their zoom ranges. Yes. Uh, you have lenses that will go on here to replace the standard lens that will cover a wide angle area so you can shoot indoors. Somebody sitting on a couch, for example, oh, or a group of okay. people on a couch, okay. or at a dinner table, you could do that. Or you can uh, uh, allow them to come in much closer with a longer zoom range. Got it. Okay. Oh, finally the world understands that women rule the world! <laughs> Yay! Okay, Believe anyway. me, we love it. I know, I love it too, yeah. but I love men. So, all right, anything else about well, this that I need to, it looks, it no. looks approachable from a functionality standpoint yep. that I don't seem to be too overwhelmed. No. And then anything Well, they're, 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 the, the mm -hmm. things that have improved in the cameras in the last three to five years and have become more and more common as far as features are concerned is that uh, you have stabilization. So even if you have a, had an extra cup of coffee today like this, <laughs> the camera will, within certain limits, uh, stop that motion that you have. So even with a, a very long zoom lens, uh, just like a pair of binoculars, it magnifies the subject, but it also magnifies your motion or you get excited. Uh, it will offset that uh, apparent lack of sharpness by adjusting some stuff uh, within the lens itself, which is, uh, this is spy stuff, I think. It's really great. Cool. So the, the camera manufacturers have, with the advancement in technology, looked at all of the various factors that contributed to degradation of image quality and that they can now put into the camera bodies or into the lenses and have solved many of those routine, aggravating things that degrade the quality of your pictures. Okay, tripods. Are you able to place these all on tripods? Yes, all the, com the cameras come with a standard quarter 20 tripod socket. Uh, and this is just the same size as a screw you'd pick up at the hardware store, but of course that screw is attached to something with three legs or a single leg in the case of a monopod, which you use for doing sports. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Joby has come up with a gorilla pod, which is an interesting piece and it's completely bendable. You can wrap it around trees or, or oh, pipes or posts sweet. or that kind of thing. So you have support no matter where you want to go. Um, and uh, then we have the traditional tripods and monopods, which will support cameras that have a little more weight or bulk to them um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have ball heads or other heads. Um, all of the various accessory categories in the last three to five years, oddly enough, they've all paralleled the changes in the cameras, but new and innovative designs at very reasonable prices have come along for flashes, tripods, and other accessories so it can make your picture taking much more enjoyable or in some cases even possible. Oh, that's really neat. Okay, just a few more questions. Sure. One thing I noticed on my camera, which 
you know, I'm in denial that it needs to probably be recycled, is that I don't have as consistent quality photos going from, what do you call these? Uh, either automatic, yeah, settings or, or uh, modes. Uh, yes, ISO uh -huh. modes. Mm -hmm. So is that a sign of age? Is there something wrong with it? When do I know that, hey, you know what, it's time to really hang it up? For some hard-headed people, like, maybe me. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the deal. The, the, and this is something that, in fact, uh, not more than 15 minutes ago, I helped a young lady who had been to Colorado, and uh, her camera, she'd been playing with it and had misset something. We don't know exactly what, but in any case, uh, every time we get the cameras fresh out of the box, we have to go through and check the settings. Uh, you never know when your friend picks up the camera and starts punching buttons. What if you and they'll are never your tell friend? you. Well, <laughs> well, it happens. So you know, if you've got a question about it, or the camera doesn't seem to be operating exactly the way that you thought it should any longer, or the way it operated when you got it, since everything is now adjustable, mm -hmm. it means that everything either uh, something may have been misset, you may have gone to a, an incorrect mode for the situation you're in, or something like that. If you bring your camera in, give us about two minutes. We'll run through the modes. We'll set it up what we call vanilla mode. That is nothing that's wild and crazy, but if you take the camera out, we set it so that all you do is walk out, click the shutter, you should come up with a good picture right off the bat. So yeah. the camera is essentially really meant to be used, generally speaking, in full automatic mode. So it's going to save you from yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's a good thing. <laughs> and what about, you know, a lot of people do eBay or econ and yep. artists. So are any of these cameras a good option for if you're selling knickknacks to yep. clothing? Any of them would work. Now, the, okay. the thing to remember about putting pictures on eBay or me emailing pictures to your friends is that nobody wants, even with high-speed connections, you can send them so big a file oh, that it can yes. take forever and yesterday to download. Right. Not good. No. Not good. So what no. you want to do is go into to, uh, Photoshop or your picture editing program, whatever's come with your computer, iPhoto, doesn't really matter. Before you send your picture to your uh, friends on the screen, you want to downsize it to approximately 72 DPI and a little smaller than the size of your screen so that Got it'll it. pop up, it'll transmit quickly. Your screen only requires 72 DPI or dots per inch. It's a pretty lousy picture to look good on the screen. For printing, if you wanted to print, we printed 300 DPI. So it'll be a larger file in terms of the amount of information contained to allow the inf that to print out on a piece of paper or however you do it. Leave it. Look, I think so, I'm catching on here. Yeah. Look, image size, Perfect. VGA, right. shoot at a small image size for email attachment. Exactly right. Yep. Look at that. If you just read, it's amazing what you can find out. Yep, yep. Okay, what is your favorite thing to photograph? Do you have a favorite object or? Uh, I, mm, I call them pie doos. What are pie Spiders. I don't... Spiders and bugs are really good. And there are lots of them in the summertime. It's great. Uh, but my cats and my kids, you know, it's those are, yeah. those are kind of in thing. I enjoy photographing people and my friends. A lot of party pictures, so yeah. Very cool. You seem very social. Well, thank you. Well, I've had a fun time with you. Well, I don't know about it. going out to photograph spiders and. Oh, we'll go do it like, someday. No, I don't know about that. <laughs> but anything, almost anything else is here at Territory. All right. Thanks for giving us the beginning, intermediate, advanced overview of technology and how you can enjoy taking photographs of whatever subject you choose. Roger, it's been fun. Good. You've Thank been you. a blast. Thank Appreciate you. It. After my lively conversation with Roger, I decided to continue my quest to appease my insatiable appetite for more artistic adventures and knowledge. So I went to a place that's my childhood mecca and a place where everyone has access to the library. With me on frame is Iowa City Public Librarian, Candace Smith. Thank you, Candace. Hi. Welcome to frame. Thank you for coming. We have a lot of art-related materials, and um, I'll start with the books, because okay. that's kind of what I think people think of most when they think of art resources. I agree. And we have a wide variety of things to pick from. We have um, traditional art-type books, which would cover an artist mm -hmm. in terms of biography or their works. 
books about museum collections and books about typical styles of art or movements or schools. Hmm. But we also include a kind of different definition of arts in that we look at what people might pursue and excel at a skill as an art. And so in that way, we also include things like crafts, like knitting, paper hmm. making, or screen printing. We include sure. music and musicians, musical instrument guides, photography, sculpture, kind of the whole gamut of arts that you might think of. How exciting. You can really you can learn taste almost anything, everything yes. and, and try your hand at so many Absolutely. styles. So what have you prepared for us today? I picked out a few things that I thought sort of spanned what we offer in terms of print and AV. Um, as you know, our community area has a pretty wide range of artistic interests, so we aim to have a collection that supports that, both for leisure and lifelong learning and also skill refinement. Um, so we collect widely mm -hmm. in a pretty moderate way, and in areas that are really popular, we'll build a much more extensive collection with a lot more materials. And so I've kind of grabbed some of those things here. Um, Where would you like to start? I'll start with kind of a perennial favorite. Impressionists are always oh, popular, yes. <laughs> and that is a traditional type of fine art, but you know, any book that I purchase that goes on the new shelf, it just checks out really well. And the regular collection has a lot of older looking Impressionist books because people just check them out year after year and we can't get rid of them and can't replace them. So <laughs> parts of the collection look kind of shabby sometimes. So here I've got a book from our new shelf, Picasso Looks at Degas. So we have lots of works on Picasso, lots yes. of works on Degas, but here's, you know, a new treatise on it, a different way of looking at it. And so it's worth adding to the collection just for that new viewpoint. Okay. Um, I can hold okay. any of these. Um, we support other arts too. So here's the Acting Bible. Oh, we have, have absolutely. A, you know, pretty thriving theater community here in Iowa City. Lots mm -hmm. of small theaters, mm -hmm. um, and also in Cedar Rapids. And so, and the and the film school here also contributes Big. to that. And that you might not think that would be a lot, but it actually does. Um, let's take it. We have a huge amount of crafting that goes on in Iowa City. I don't know about Cedar Rapids, but we are full of crafters, and we have several really great, you know, unique craft stores, and the crafting books just fly off the shelves. So I brought out Rowan's Greatest Knits because this mm. is kind of a um, reworking of a previous Rowan book that had gone out of print and you couldn't get the material anymore, and then this came out, and I was like, oh, I should buy it. And everybody flocked so, and got um, it. Knitting is wildly popular. It really um, has taken on a resurgence. Yes, a lot of yes. knitting stores yep. uh, around at least North America when I've traveled. Yeah. I brought one of my favorites here cool. is um, The Lost Painting by Jonathan Haar about Caravaggio, mm -hmm. and uh, just a kind of fantastic art history and mystery of a lost painting that a young graduate research student found after mm. hundreds of years of being missing. So books like this are also very popular in addition to instructional materials, general art and art history um, circulates pretty well here. Fun. What else? You can travel around the world. Yeah. I, I, this happened to grab my eye. Masterpieces yes. of Islamic art. Uh, we aim to provide resources for you know all different types of art. So when something as comprehensive as this comes out, mm -hmm. um, almost, not quite regardless of the price, but we'll go and buy you know, a pretty nice, expensive book because it's just such a treat to be able to offer that to patrons. Um, a lot of the books you see here are kind of, the, they're beautiful, they're lavishly illustrated, oh, yes. um, but they're big and they're they cumbersome are. and they can be expensive and I think a lot of people just don't buy themselves these kinds of books, so we keep that in mind and know that you know our upper limit for our books is a little bit more than other materials so that we can offer that to people. Absolutely. It takes a while to establish your own mm -hmm. art book collection. Oh, they are they are quite expensive. And one thing when checking out art books, I in any book, give it so much extra respect because I know that so many people would love to have access to this information sure. and to have it to mm -hmm. buy it for your own collection yeah. is is quite a treat. So this is another, I'm not familiar with this one, so I look forward to learning more about that. Yeah, she kind of has a small local connection, so kind of another one of those random artists that's popular here, but huh. you just, you know, wouldn't know it. All right, we have other discoveries, and this is what I love about the library and reading, The Gates of Paradise. You were yes. telling me a little story about this book. This was a patron suggestion, so people can suggest that we buy works, and generally we do. And yeah. The Gates of Paradise are Lorenzo Ghiberti's um, it's the doors of the baptistry of the Duomo in Florence, which 
If you go to the Duomo now, the real doors are not outside. They've moved the real ones to a museum, but they went on tour a couple years ago and came to Chicago. And so a lot of people I knew went to it, and I did not go to it, but when I saw the book came out, I thought, oh, that's something that I think people would enjoy. I love their museum. It's just oh, fantastic. such one of my favorite places to go. There was also another more yes. local regional connection. Is this it? Great collection of centuries of art. Um, this is another Chicago connection, and so it just came out. It's a brand new book, and so many people have probably seen some of these works that this family collected over the years and then donated to the museum in Chicago. And just, again, a nice thing for people who have been there and really like it or who can't go there but maybe want to learn about it. Um, I love getting books like that. Oh, they're so special. And of course, we have a lot of books in relation to the University of Iowa Museum. Um, and they circulate yes. very well. We buy multiple copies. It's just not as accessible right now to get in. To get it. That's, that's a delightful, yes. delightful place. Let's move from painting and sketching. You have some other genres yeah. of art, styles of art. The printmaking Bible. Yes. And this actually is is enjoying a resurgence it is. that I've noticed. Yep. I uh, keep buying printmaking books and they keep circulating really well, so I mm. buy more. And it's just, we have several local places that I do think do their own yes. sort of screen printing and yes. printmaking and you know offer those as t-shirts or prints. Um, kind of, not exactly an underground type of art, but very individual yeah. and unique, and that's Iowa City. That is, <laughs> and that, that was my question. Why do you think it has such a resurgence? I think you hit it. Yeah, I mean, we just have a wide variety of, you know, a lot of students who come here come from different areas and have different ideas about what they want to do and what kind of art they want to make, and so we get a really wide array of things here. So it's self-expression, too. Yes, absolutely. And then peeking over your hand, yeah. touring musician handbook. Yeah. Music books are popular, a lot of local oh, bands. Yes. Um, I buy a lot of song books, a lot of guitar instruction manuals, and they check them out. They treat them really well, make a mm -hmm. lot of requests for stuff, and uh, oh. we have a really large song book collection that, you know. It's interesting. And this one includes a DVD ROM. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. There you go, musicians. You might want to come over here for that. Okay, I'll let you take over. What else do you have? Let's see, I picked a couple What's DVDs and CD sets here because we do have an AV collection that has some art materials. Some instructional things, like the DVDs mm -hmm. have a nice selection of drawing materials and pottery. Mm -hmm. For the most part, the AV is going to be kind of a passive learning mm -hmm. or an enjoyment type of thing. So I just grabbed a couple of our great courses series, which some people may have heard about. And um, for instance, in the DVD section we have from Monet to Van Gogh, the history of Impressionism, and that's actually, oh. uh, I think it's a two-set DVD thing, and then um, Museum Masterpieces of the Louvre, so if you don't mm. get to go there, you can watch it right on your television. And then in audio, we have things like how to listen to and understand great music, which is, this, we've had this for years and we keep reordering it, it's oh. very popular. Um, Robert Greenberg is a really popular lecturer. So mm. um, we have several sets of courses like that in the, in the AV. Oh. And then, you know, documentaries about artists and uh, styles of art and things oh. like that also. Yes, I love yeah. checking out documentaries. Yes. They're fun. What other resources do you have that people may not be aware of? For arts, of? for arts mm -hmm. in general, um, yeah. besides the books in the AV, um, we don't have a ton of other things in other formats. I mean, we have a lot of instructional things in mm -hmm. print format because that's what lends itself best mm -hmm. to instructing in art right now. Um, we do have a lot of databases and other types of ways of offering information. Mm -hmm. Those don't touch into the art world quite yet, at least not for us. The university probably has some different huh. databases, like arts-related databases, and I know that they took their whole, um, I believe they took their whole slide library and digitized it for students. So oh, now when you wow. take the huge survey courses, you don't have to go in and watch the slides in the class. You can access them online. Well, that brings me to a, another question I had. I, as I stated, love the library from the day my parents introduced me to it. So how has technology changed how the library operates, what resources you have available, mm -hmm. and how people access those resources? Sure. As things get digitized more and more and put into uh, database type formats, mm -hmm. that means we have to shift you know, more of our funding over to purchase those types of things, which mm -hmm. Is generally okay because they do get used mm -hmm. and they're taking the place of something that maybe was no longer sustainable in a print format. 
Got For it. instance, um, not related to arts exactly, but we have a humongous series of books called Chilton's and their motor manuals for fixing cars. But you can't buy them anymore, and ours are just falling apart because people check them out like crazy. Oh. But now we have the Chilton's database, so it's all in there forever, and you print out what you need. Oh, so you come here to do that? Yeah, or, or do from that, home. Uh, you can access home. our databases from home. Oh. If you live in our patron base area of Iowa City, okay. rural Johnson County, or our contract areas, um, okay. and then you have your card number and password. And so you can access our databases from home. So we kind of have a 24 7 flow of Certainly. information. Um, our ebook and e audio mm -hmm. offerings that we have through the catalog, you can oh, also get from home. So if you want to download you know, an audio, or oh, really? read an ebook on your device. We offer quite a collection of those. Not as big as the book collection, obviously, sure. but we're building but it every, all the time. And is that free? It is well? free, yes. Oh. Um, for those same block, we kind of have two levels of patronage. We have sure. the very local patrons, Iowa mm -hmm. City, rural mm -hmm. Johnson County, mm -hmm. Hills, and University Heights, who pay mm -hmm. for us to service them. Mm -hmm. That is access to all things. If you live within the state and live in an area that is part of the Open Access Library program, so for instance, Cedar Rapids, you can get a card here and check out materials and everything. You can't access those databases remotely, but you can come here and use Got them. it. And here. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so how do people become members? You would come into the library and go to the left end of the circulation desk. Okay. And we have a form that you fill out to get a card. And we ask for photo ID and proof of your current address. And then you get a nice bright yellow card and Yay. all the privileges that go with it. Wonderful. Yeah. See, it's very very short and sweet. Yeah. Five minutes yeah. in and yes. out. You, yes. know, you open the door to a whole new world, literally, Absolutely. of learning and so many different things. And then there's a resource on how to the, how the use the library, how to yeah. check out materials. We have a nice little there lending handouts for people. Um, and all of this is online at our website as well, but we have borrowing lending. Explain that. What do you think? I don't yeah. mean to cut you off. So oh, no, no. Point. Okay, art to go is our collection, very unique collection of uh, framed posters and prints of well-known artists, and then another part of it is original art that we mm -hmm. offer to patrons to check out and take home with them for two months. Wow. Yeah. And we'll show everybody what that is exactly. That's it's That's a very, very nice special. collection, very unique. We've had it since the late 60s, I believe. And then we have a kind of adjacent art purchase prize contest that we do every year which is how we get original art to the collection and I can't remember exactly how long that's been going but a good number of years. That's a great opportunity yeah. for aspiring artists and even established artists yes. to bring something new to the table and support mm -hmm. the community. Now, do you have a, any newsletter that you send out? How can people learn about that and put it on their calendar so they're ready for it? The when the contest time? comes around, it's usually, it's in October, but we start soliciting entries uh, in mid-summer, and okay. at that time we will start putting the flyers around town, and we have a PR person who will do kind of a news media sure. release that goes to all the sources and it'll be on our website and okay. if the paper picks it up they'll run it sometimes they don't um, so we just try and get the word out and people know about it enough that they'll even call and ask you know when a, when a submission anything else that you can share with the audience to understand the great resource the library is and how they can expand their knowledge of, of all styles of Oh, just that I would encourage people to come in or whatever library is in your area because you may think you know what your library holds, but I guarantee you it'll be so much more. This Absolutely. is really special. Thank you so oh, thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you for getting your the time. word out. Absolutely. Okay, everyone, go on your own adventure. As you can see, this is just a small sampling of what's available to you through your public library and find every way possible to support them. Thanks for tuning in to Frame. I'm your host, Yvette Craddock. I